Hi, everybody. Welcome today to the last event for Richter Association for the Arts for the spring season. And today our theme is bullying. And um, we have a book that the uh, Poet Laureate of Marin Can County edited, and it's called From Harm to Harmony. And it's about what you can do with bullying to come out ahead instead of just always the victim. And we have a high school poet who won today, and she's going to be reading her poem as well as some book, um, poems from the book. And her name is Tajaya McLean. So please welcome Tajaya. No, you said it right. Oh, good. Hi. 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 Um, so I found out about this because of my English teacher. And um, this was before we had our own event called Word Fest at our school. So it's basically doing what we're doing now, except the whole school gets to come and gets to talk into the mic and like says, say their poems and hear poems from other people and other students, other teachers, and all that good stuff. So um, this is my poem. My heart is a warrior taking the blows as they come, always bleeding out but never left for dead, leaving with bruises and scratches we call war scars, constellations, black and blue galaxies that I get lost in, anything to make the abuse sound acceptable, sound pretty. Fists shouldn't be gifts of love, hurtful words shouldn't be sounds of affection, the only thing that, accept that is acceptable is sorry. sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. M.J. Pramick, he lives in San, Fr San Francisco, California, and he wrote this poem called The Well. I assume I got it from you, my inheritance, your genes, your fear, my habit of gritting my jaw, clenching my face into a fist, a, a meaningness of less, of no account, mediocre second rate. Climbing up the rope, hand over fist, out of the well, exhaustion. I find you no longer live here. Still, I cower, unseen on surface, but sunk inside where I cannot hide. Mm. This poem is called Black Flowers, and it's by David Beckman, and he lives in Santa Rosa, California. Faces sun-scorched, fists tight as knots, they surround him in his backyard. Knuckles fly like bats, dust and blood, shame. Births black flowers he'll rid of as soon as he forgets those hands, those faces. Are, are these people that wrote the poems, are they students? No. Yeah. 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 Many of them are famous. Many varied ages. Um, yeah, there were accomplished poets, many of them. Accomplished yeah. poets. Yes. Um, this one is called That Stone, and it's by Richard Cru Cruz Brown, and he lives in Kentsfield, California. That stone, gray on the ground, can be lifted. It can be thrown to hit the flesh and bruise it, blue. That stick can be taken hold of, lifted to smack down upon the body with its sting and smart. While words royal in the throats, they can be spat out to char the mind, flamed into the face. Burn into the heart, sear the soul, brand deep a scar into the unprotected spirit. Thank you. Okay, so I'll read you a few of the poems in here that I liked a whole lot. And as I say, this was um, edited by um, Joseph Zaccardi, who is the Poet Laureate of Marin County in California. This is... Um, <coughs> one second. Except I'm in it also, and I'm from Danbury. <laughs> Dreadful play. Eternity stood between the ringing of the bell and the stepping of my feet onto the playground. I was suffocating, guts swirling around my stomach pit. 
Suddenly the air cracked and nothing mattered except my fear and my escape. I ran, flew, hard as my heart could go beyond the sea of kids, yet she overcame me, her feet fueled by playground eyes, a mixture sick with terror and awe. One quick blow sent my whole body skidding onto the slick asphalt. I couldn't get up, couldn't fight back, couldn't stop my crybaby face. The gawking wouldn't stop. And it is only now that I know it took so long to see that it was her guilt, her shame, her disgrace plastered painfully on my face. Gives me the goose pimples. Did you say your poem was in that book? Yes. Would you read it? Yes, I definitely will, but I'm going to read a few more that I really like. Evacuation Day, June 5th, 1942. At an empty station beside the train track's quiet gleam is dusk, the in between time of a warm June evening. With brakes screeching, a truck skids to a stop at the platform, spilling out young soldiers, rifles slung over their backs, drunkenly shoving each other, shattering a window pane in the station. With a hiss, a black train creeps in, silent. The Japanese families approach, dressed in their Sunday best, numbered and tagged. They line up to board, heavy with what they are allowed to carry. Throughout the night, the train carries its freight from the Yakuhima Valley homes to an unknown future. Soldiers order shades drawn, parade the aisles, point rifles, as though the weary prisoners could escape. Pulling into the stockyard, the train's shriek signals arrival. But still in darkness, the cargo hears only the clang of the closing gate. And I should have said that was written by Jody L. Hotel, a poet and teacher. And the other one, I forgot to tell you the name of the poet. Shame on me. <laughs> um, that's Carolyn Rice, and she lives in Tiburon, Tiburon California. And she's also, she's a poet and an archaeologist. This is written by Mark Doty, who's incredibly famous, from New York City. Charlie Howard's Descent. Between the bridge and the river, he falls through a huge portion of night. It is not as if falling is something new. Over and over, he slipped into the gulf between what he knew and how he was known. What others wanted opened like an abyss. The laughing stock clerks at the grocery, women at the luncheonette, amused by his gestures. What could he do? Live with one hand tied behind his back? So he began to fall into the star-faced section of night between the trestle and the water because he could not meet a little town's demands and his earrings shone and his wrists were as limp as they were. I imagine he took the insults in and made of them a place to live. We learn to use the names because they are there. Familiar furniture, faggot, was the bed he slept on in hard and white but simple somehow, queer, something sharp, but finally useful, a tool, all the jokes, a chair, stiff-backed to keep the spine straight, a table, a lamp, and because he's fallen for 23 years, despite whatever awkwardness his flailing arms and legs assume, he is beautiful, and like any good diver, has only an edge of fear he transforms into grace, or else he is not afraid, and in this way climbs back up the ladder of his fall, out of the river into the arms of the three teenage boys who hurled him from the edge. Really boys now, afraid their father's cars shivering behind them, headlights on, and tells them it's all right that he knows they didn't believe him when he said he couldn't swim, and blesses his killers in the way that only the dead can afford to forgive. Really could make you cry. 
This is written by Michael C. He lives in Michigan, and he's in the 10th grade. He wants to be a writer and a teacher. And he's writing to Joseph Zaccardi. Dear Mr. Joseph, I wrote this letter. My name is Mike. My first 16 years I spent in a home for me. I have autism. My brother Chris, who I never remember, got me out. I miss my teacher, Mrs. Reese, who is very kind and beautiful. But it's better now. Chris could not find me. He's 24 years old now and is married to Susan, my new sister. They have no children. She is kind and wants a baby, which I wish hope for her. She typed this letter, but I wrote this letter because when I was sent to a regular school, not everyone was nice to me. They said, I eat funny and talk funny. I was sad. But Mr. Principal talked to all of us and said this is bad for me and them too. This book my brother told me about, I wish to be in because it is a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Poet, for reading this. I hope you are happy like me too. I wrote this letter and Chris says it is good. Very, very moving. And I guess I really should mention that today with the internet, cyberbullying has become so terrible and it grows proportionately with the capacity to reach out to the world so that it's so magnified, the bullying, and it's so horrific, and there isn't enough attention paid to it. Um, this one is written by Barbara Welsh Brooks. She lives in Nevada, California. 21. Look at him. He's six feet four, lost between worlds of structure and imagination, a future shaped like a question mark, curiosity beaten out of him in second grade when his mocha-colored hand waved to be called on, made him different, moved to the back of room, the room for juxtaposing letters on the page, no one teacher caught his frustration of seeing words differently. He hits the target like baseballs thrown to him, a home run kid. He tells me he loves history, the video games he plays to relieve his stress, the mystery of identity. He's somewhere in a line between college and unemployment. Who's the black guy, they ask. He's half and half, coffee and cream. He seems different. He was a curiosity when we moved to a place where Confederate flags waved from antennae of junk cars, a cross burned on a lawn. He practiced high school football, couldn't take a shower in the locker room. We don't allow slaves in here, they said, and blocked his way. He quit. The school bus was dangerous. Anyone for white power? A kid shouted. Half the bus stood up and raised clenched fists. We learn to sort by color, shape, and size, how to put things in boxes. The odd ones that do not match are set aside. The unmatched ones can see things differently. I ask, are you afraid? He says, who's going to mess with me? They see a six foot four inch black guy. I caution him. Don't wear a hoodie, no saggy pants, no hands in pockets. He moves differently now. And this is um, from Julia. Um, she lives in Sebastopol, California. She was born in Florida, and she's a poet and novelist. To the editor, Dear Joe, Name hazing began in second grade. I was new to this school. I didn't know anyone, but I soon became the champion of the boys at marbles with my great grandmother's cache of ancient cat eye stone boulders, steelies in two sizes, agates and crystal puries. She sewed me a drawstring bag for them on her treadle sewing machine, big enough for the marbles I'd win. And when I did, when my bag got too full, I gave back the winnings, glass marbles you could buy at the store, but never my treasure. 
Grandmother's gift helped me connect to my, to, to my new world as it had her own little boy in 1918. These were Uncle Grant's marbles. But I was a kid in 1954, and I had to test the boundaries in my new world. I'm still haunted by calling out in the noon line, Sarah Salvato, the big potato. The beautiful Miss Reddy brought me into the line in moments. Why, Julia, I'm surprised at you. That's unkind. Her face, which I worshipped, clouded with hurt. Her goodness and voice conveyed a disappointment with me that has made all the difference in that being nipped in the bud. What a beautiful day it is. And this one is mine. Tact can be a weapon that declaws opponents. Anger causes our backs to arch, the fur along our spines and tails to form a ridge, making us seem larger, more menacing. I want to draw back my upper lip, snarl and wrinkle my face as I hiss and spit. After testing my claws, verifying their sharpness, my anger toward my anger toward the hissing of others is muted. Some, ready to pounce, see my head bent low as I approach, weaving a bit left, a bit right. They decide to play. This is called The Fair Fight, and it's written by John Lau. Walking to the cafeteria, I hear it, almost inarticulate, like the shouts of a primitive clan killing a mammoth. Get him, get him, get Alfie, don't be chicken. I see students running toward a circle in the quad. By the time I get there, a sizable crowd has gathered in the midst of, with, of which two big muscular youths punch, gouge, kick, wrestle on the ground. One's Alfie, my ex-student. The other is named Armand. I try to penetrate the circle, shouting, stop, I'm a teacher as we're expected to do. But two of Armand's gang lock arms in front of me, all the while screaming, kick him, Armand, fuck him up. Both boys are bleeding when two burly teachers and a campus security guard break through the circle, take them away. The crowd disperses, debating about who won. Later that day, Victor, a polite boy in class who might never have suspected to be cruel, remarks, it was okay a fight, but I like it better when it's two on one. And this is the last one that I'm going to read. It's written by June Sylvester Saracino, and it's called Shame. I can't recall what word or slight enraged me at recess when I grabbed you a bony wrist and swung you around like a rag doll, then thud and whimper as you hit the ground. Got his ass kicked by a girl. It was a jeer no bully could resist. Predatory boys gave you swirlies in the bathroom. In the lunch line, they'd yell in your face, Hey, Chester! Fingers stabbing your chest, glad to see you back slapping homo on your back as you struggled not to fall. Your delicate mother, milk-faced and nervous, brought cupcakes for everyone on your birthday. How could she have known, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> how could she have known how much worse that bribe made your days? Mama's boy, they hissed on the playground, pussy. The last time you came back from bathroom break, hair dripping on your button-down shirt, near hysterical crying, hiccuping so hard, the teacher had to take you outside to calm you. The boys snorted and laughed, then looked at their shoes, fidgeted, squirmed in their seats like small animals caught in traps. Thank you very much. I wish there was a lot more talk, and um, especially in schools, about bullying because it's such an important topic, and the scars that it leaves are so permanent. And I just hope that you spread the word. <laughs> and once again, for our winner, some applause for our high school winner. Come stand up. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, do I have to say the title of it? Or? Pardon? Do I say like the title of it and everything? Yes, or? definitely. Okay. So I titled this one, I'm Michaela. I'm Michaela. I'm 18 years old. I believe that laughter is the best medicine and that a spoonful of sugar gives you the satisfaction in life that you didn't know existed. I believe being around the people you love is more important than, getting, than going out with strangers. I believe that there are two sides to everyone, but some people have perfected hiding it. I believe that at a point in time, people's masks are taken off for the world to see. But for me, it's not while the sun shines on my face or when the sun sets for the night, but when the moon is at its peak and the stars shine bright. My mask comes off at around 3 a.m. There's something about 3 a.m. that scares me, not because of the fear of seeing a face in my window, but a fear of the face I look at in the mirror. Because at 3 a.m., everything that hides behind red lipstick and boots is unmasked for the world to see. When it's 3 a.m., I'm alone in my room. I'm left with the thoughts that I push away all day. At 3 a.m., I'm not the girl who's comfortable in her skin. At 3 a.m., I'm, I'm the girl with the scar on her chest from an insecurity that I got rid of. At 3 a.m., I'm not happy with my weight. At 3 a.m., my thighs are not proportionate to my legs. At 3 a.m., I, I notice which eye is bigger. At 3 a.m., I'm afraid of my future. At 3 a.m., I have no one to hold me and tell me everything will be okay. But at 4 a.m., everything changes. Oh, I have the, re residue off of, the residue from tears off of my face. I put all my insecurities and emotions into a box under my pillow and lay my head to rest. I go to sleep knowing that tomorrow is a new day and then maybe the thoughts from 3 a.m. may actually be put to rest. I wake up the next morning, put on the red lipstick and boots, and pretend that my life is perfect. I silently go about my day thinking about one hour in which I'm broken to pieces. I hope and pray all day that I finally get a good night's rest. Now for a real upbeat thing, we're going to have Ben read us some of his songs from a musical that he's written himself. The poem I'm about to read started out as lyrics to a two-part song. It can be said that songs are poems put to music. The song is entitled, First Encounters. Part one, First Encounters, Girl. Did he just ask me for a date? Or does a cup of coffee over shop talk seal my fate? I must stay calm and be alert. I must not let him think that I'm the kind who likes to flirt. Will he suggest that he would like to walk with me through the park and underneath the maple trees? Will he find me a friendly sort the kind of person he would like to court. He has a very friendly smile, the kind of face that lets you know he wants to stay a while. But look at me, we've hardly met, and I am fantasizing flying with him on a jet. Perhaps he's got a girl with pretty eyes and curls, one who makes him laugh and sets his heart a whirl. It would be nice for me to know a man who wants to see a friendship grow. Now part two, first encounters boy. Can a first encounter show what a person's all about? Does that sparkle in her blue eyes give me hope or give me doubt? Does she do the crossword puzzle with her coffee and her toast? Does she wear a bright bikini when she's swimming on the coast? Does she drive a two-door Ford or a sporty four-wheel drive? Does she like to go to movies or to hike the mountains rise? Will she speak to me tomorrow? Can we turn another page? Will it lead to joy or sorrow? Will it make my passion rage? I must let her know somehow that I want to be a friend for today and for tomorrow, never needing to pretend.
thank you very much. I think most of us can identify with those feelings, even from both sides. <laughs>